Bluff Marine Sanctuary. I'm Monique and I'm a marine ranger with Parks Victoria. Parks Victoria would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land on which we meet today, the Wadawurrung, and acknowledge the elders of past, present and emerging. Farm Bluff Marine Sanctuary is a critical interface where the marine environment meets the terrestrial environment. Where these two environments meet to create a habitat where if any animal or plant can live here, they have to have the most amazing adaptations to survive. The rocky platform provides a buffer, softening the blows of the waves and protecting the dunes and the beach system here. With those rocks and wave action, it creates an incredible habitat with lots of rugosity. If you have a rock platform with lots of rugosity, it means lots of microhabitats where animals can shelter from all the effects that they're faced with on the intertidal zone, such as wind, rain, increased salinity, increased sunshine, increased temperature and increased predation. So not only do birds come at low tide to come and forage to see what they can find here, traditionally people have also come and gathered food and plants from the intertidal zone for their survival. Traditionally the Wadawurrung from this part of Victoria have used these intertidal zones for gathering really essential food items such as guarana snails, abalone and lots of different seaweeds as a food source and also as a medicinal source. So you can see in this lump of sandstone you've got amazing rugosity, lots of tiny little microhabitats and space for animals to shelter in. This is the leeward side of the rock and the prevailing side's facing the ocean. On the prevailing side there are no periwinkles to speak of. They're all clustered in on this leeward side where there's protection from the elements, protection from the waves and they're tucked into these tiny little crevices which create microclimates. It's usually a couple of degrees cooler or a couple of degrees warmer than the ambient temperature in there and it does collect some of the spray that comes over which helps keep these guys lubricated and keep them cool as well. What these little periwinkles have done is they've released a glue like mucus and stuck themselves onto it and sealed themselves off from the world. They've got to wait about six to eight hours before the tide comes back in. So they need to trap enough seawater in these tiny shells to give them enough oxygen to keep on breathing. Once the tide comes in, they'll start to move about and start to graze off any microalgae that's sitting on this rock with their little tongues. But in the meantime, they need to just wait it out. Another benefit of clustering into these tiny little microhabitats is that there's safety in numbers. There's more than one, which means there's less exposure um, and likelihood of predation as well for these little guys. Well, living in this marine environment, one of the things that the animals need to cope with is really high impact from waves and high wave action. So one of the adaptations that some organisms have taken up is being sessile, which means they're stuck on the rock and they can't move around. You can see here we've got a proliferation of barnacles that are stuck on that rock and they cannot move to get food and they cannot move to reproduce. So what they actually do is they open up a little aperture in their shell and allow their little feathery feet to come out. What they're doing is they're filtering out any phytoplankton or zooplankton from the water when it comes in at high tide and then pulling those full feet back into the shell and licking those little food particles out of those little feathery toes. You can even see how the periwinkles have upcycled the calcium carbonate shell of the barnacle once it's been predated upon and then are living inside that creating its own microhabitat. It's really important to know that even though shells might be empty on the beach, they still serve a purpose for many creatures including hermit crabs. So rather than take them home, leave them there and let them be part of the environment. Wow, the super literal zone is a tricky place to survive. Did you know that there are three zones here on the intertidal reef? The super literal where we just were, the mid literal you can see here, and the sub literal we are going to see a bit later. Animals and plants become more diverse the closer we get to the water. So one of the things that we always need to be mindful of when we're down on the intertidal zone is just where we put our fingers. Lots and lots of life gets trapped in these beautiful little rock pools and it's amazing to go and fossick around and have a look at them. But we want to be mindful of one little critter that lives in here known as the blue ring octopus. He tends to be asleep during the day and he'll wedge himself right underneath the rock but he'll throw all of his little arms above his head which means the first thing you might brush up against with your fingers is his little beak and that's where the venom sits. So whenever we're foster king in a pool we keep our fingers where we can see them. I'd never put my fingers down underneath the rock where I can't see them out of view but what I am going to show you is this beautiful little pin cushion star. These sea stars don't eat the way we do. 
We have a mouth and teeth and a tongue to help us enjoy our food. Sea stars have an incredible way of eating. So they vomit up their stomach, sit it onto some food that they'd like to eat, let the stomach digest it, and then when it's full, they swallow it back up. I'll see if I can find you one that's still got its stomach ingested. Perhaps this little one here. You can see on one side, they've got lovely camouflage colors, but on the underside, they're a beautiful blue. You can start to see that mouth aperture there where the stomach comes out of, and that's how they graze. They have no teeth whatsoever. So they scoot about, basically scavenging whatever they can find. The best way to find creatures here is to look under the rocks. Whenever I turn a rock over, I'm always very careful I don't crush anything. And I always remember to turn the rock back over as well. One of the cheekier characters that live here are shore crabs. And shore crabs are amazing inhabitants of the rock pools. They're really well adapted, they've got a hard shell keeps them safe from predators and it lets them scuttle in under tight rock crevices without scraping their soft body parts. A really unique way to tell if they're a boy or a girl is if you turn them over you can have a look at their abdomen and they've got a tail called a telson. If it's a triangle shape like this one it means it's a boy. Girls tend to have a really lovely large horseshoe shaped one and she uses her bigger telson to carry all of her eggs when she's in berry. So we've got a little boy here and you can see again beautiful camouflage colours for the environment that this little crab chooses to live in. And they're a scavenger as well. They'll basically eat anything that comes their way. Super important for keeping the rock pools clean. And they're a super important prey out item for an apex predator that lives here in the rock pools, octopus. Octopus absolutely adore these little guys. So they do have a battle ahead of them at night time when the octopus come out to feed. But another amazing adaptation of these guys is because they've got that lovely suit of armor to keep them safe. The trade-off is, is that when they want to grow, they have to shed that hard skin. So they actually pull out of it once every six months or so by backing out of the end there, lifting up their carapace, and they pull all of their soft body parts out. What they then do is fill up with as much water as they can until the new skin layer gets nice and hard. Then they let that water go and it gives them about six months of growing room. They need to do that every time they need to grow. Unlike us, our skin just stretches with us, but these guys need to go through that molting process. What they also do with the molting process is they get a new stomach lining and a new set of gills. It means that they can eat the old ones in the two weeks that they're waiting for their skin to get hard before they can head on out and find some fresh food to eat. This is called a dog whelk. If I turn him over, you can see he's actually a big predatory snail or a meat-eating snail. And the way I know that is that the opening is a semicircle or a gravy boat shape. You can see a little lip here, and that's where its siphon comes out. And you might be able to see the siphon just resting in that lip. The siphon is the dog whelk's tool to detect any possible prey items. Once the dog whelk finds a snail to prey on, they will use a radula to drill through the shell and access the prey item underneath. And other snails here, this is a little warrener snail. He doesn't live in his shell anymore. He's got a round opening, and that means he's a grazing gastropod or a grazing snail. They have a different type of tongue. They have a tongue called a radula. They use that radula to scrape microalgae that's growing off the rock, which you can't even see right now. This little guy here is called a cart rut snail. He's got a rounded opening. He actually likes to graze on some of the microalgae that's growing on the rocks. If this little guy gets disturbed, or the tide goes out unexpectedly, he has an ingenious way of keeping himself safe. There is an operculum or disc shaped shell stuck on its body. As the snail goes into the shell, the operculum closes the shell like a door, keeping the snail safe or trapping oxygenated seawater. I'm going to pop these guys back into the Neptune's necklace. They've been out of the water long enough and like the crab and the pincushion star, they use camouflage as an adaptation to avoid predators. Look how well they blend into the seaweed. Now you see me, now you don't. As we come down to the rock shelf here, we have a whole spectrum of beautiful different algae that are living on this amazing rock. So these rock pools provide a great habitat for a lot of fish species, as all those different strands of seaweed provide this nice dense habitat where they can use it as cover from predators such as birds. A lot of marine plants create oxygen as well. So some of these uh, different seagrasses down here in this intertidal area 
a great example of seeing that. Here you can see the sea nymph photosynthesizing. The leaves absorb the sunshine and the dissolved carbon dioxide to create a chemical reaction in the leaves chloroplasts. The result is glucose, which the plants use to grow, and oxygen, which is good for us. Check out the oxygen bubbles drifting to the surface. Marine plants are responsible for contributing over half of the world's oxygen. So like all plants, the marine plants and seaweeds need water, nutrients and sunlight to survive. As the tide comes in and out over the course of the day, it traps a lot of water and marine creatures inside these spaces in the reef. Inside this rock pool alone, there's fish species, octopus, crabs, phytoplankton, a whole system of the animal food chain. Rock pool inhabitants are tuned into even the most subtle changes to their environment. A shadow, a noise or a vibration are all cues to duck for cover and for good reason. Marine birds know to come and forage during the small window of opportunity provided by the outgoing tide. They have razor sharp beaks, good eyesight and can stay as still as a statue, catching trapped fish unaware. As you enter the subtidal zone, the biodiversity increases dramatically. The reason for this is that the subtidal zone is an easier place to live. There is always a blanket of seawater keeping the animals in a more stable, less variable environment. And it provides a wide range of nutrients for animals to feed off. There is a wonderful array of fish, algae and invertebrates in this underwater garden. All of the organisms here are linked together in some way and rely on the sea for survival. Bowen Bluff Marine Sanctuary has been protected since 2002, which is helping to preserve this unique biodiversity. As beautiful as this place is, it is under threat from impacts including pollution from stormwater runoff, agricultural practices, trampling, dog disturbance, poaching and plastics. Doing the right thing by the environment is easy. Take only memories and leave only footprints. Thanks for coming out with us today to Rockpool Ramble and learn about this beautiful marine environment here at Bowen Bluff Marine Sanctuary. Don't forget you can come out here anytime with your family and friends and explore the intertidal zones across the different marine parks and coastal areas in Victoria. 